Let's get started. My name is Chuki Chen, and today we'll be talking about Advanced Android Text View. The whole slide deck is available online, and the link is shown already, so you can follow along, or the link is going to be available at the end as well. So either way, it's fine. I also um, already, I think, posted it on Twitter. So if you go to my Twitter, you can also get the link there. All right? Um, so I want to say that up front. If you cannot see or you could not hear me, let me know. Uh, I don't mind interruptions. I'd rather you get the maximum out of this lecture rather than being shy and uh, squint at the tiny little font on your screen. Um, and the other thing is, yeah, there are a lot of code in this talk. So if you find it difficult to see and you know, we try to make a font bigger and it's still not that good, you can follow along on your computer. That may work better as well. That's why the link is there. All right, there's some more people. So let's just uh, wait a little bit and then we'll go ahead and get started. We're going to start this talk with a quote. Has anybody seen this quote before? Yeah, one person. So what is it complaining about? So what it says is that, all right, you are trying to display an image with a text view, and you wrap it inside linear layout because it's right next to each other but it's trying to tell you that actually text view knows already how to display images and it suggests that you use a compound drawable to display that image. Let's see how that looks like. Here we go, we have a text view specified in XML. The first three lines are pretty standard, wrapped content, wrapped content, and then I'm gonna show the text animation and then we are going to use the XML attributes drawable left, drawable right, and drawable bottom to put in the three things around. Has anyone used that before? Okay, that's good. But there's something more to this because we are at the advanced Android text view talk. Notice the name of my drawables. Anything jumps out at you? They're verbs. Hmm? They're verbs. They're verbs. Okay, what, what do the verbs do? So it says rotating, animated, and animated again. So right now, if you just do it in XML like that, it will not move. But we can actually animate these compound drawables. The way it works is that the rotating loading on, uh, XML file, for example, instead of a direct PNG, is actually an animated rotate XML file. What it does is you can use it to tell Android that, okay, load this drawable, I see loading, and then set the pivot point at the middle of it, and then allow it to rotate, and then that also set a duration for how long. Um, under the hood, this will get translated into this class called animated rotate drawable, which implements animatable. The next thing in my text view is an animated wifi.xml. This one is a frame-by-frame -frame animation, and you use the XML tag animation list to specify that. Here, I have four frames, zero, one, two, three, because we are computer scientists, have to count from zero. And each of them, I will have a duration of 250 milliseconds. And what that happens is that Android will load this and then go ahead and show each frame the duration that you specify. Once again, this gets translated into the Java class animation drawable, which implements animatable. Finally, the animated clock one is a little bit more interesting. It's an animated vector, which allows you to actually tell Android what to draw. So previously, you still have to give it a PNG file, essentially, and then ask it to be rotated or swap in and out. However, there's a little caveat here. The animated vector drawable class, which implements animatable, is introduced in Lollipop. So right now, you cannot use it in versions older than that. There are noises about it being in the support library, but it's not available right now. So with all that, we still need to do one more thing to make it animated. Yes, this time uh, my screenshot is actually moving just to prove to you that yes, I can make them move even if they are not standalone image views. They are a part of the text view. What you need to do is that you need to start the animation. And the way you do that is you go through all the drawables 
that is attached to this text field. So that's what the first line does. It gives you an array of drawables. And then you iterate through them. You check that it's not null. If it's, because, for example, in this case, the top one is actually not set. So if it's null, then don't bother. Or if it's animatable. So sometimes you may have a mix of it, right? Maybe one of them is just a plain old image, and the other one is an animatable. So we want to make sure that it is castable to an animatable. So the three classes that I showed you earlier all implement animatable, which means that I can call the start function on it, and then it will move. So it would be good practice to call this in your on, on resume function, so that the animation is only goes when someone's looking at it, and then in on pause, do a, something very similar, but call stop on your animatable instead. Okay? So this is kind of a, give a good flavor of what this talk's going to be about. There'll be a lot of different techniques about doing more, anim, um, not, not necessarily animated, but more advanced uh, things with your text field. So more XML fun. So I showed you how to add images to your text view. How many of you have seen this shadow business in text view? One person, two, oh, okay, actually six, okay. One person very fast, six people slower. Uh, so what you can do in your text view is actually you can specify a shadow, a drop shadow essentially. Um, if you look at all the parameters here, basically all the ones that has the prefix shadow are the ones that we are using to specify this shadow. And you can see kind of how it got offset a little bit to the right and to the bottom, and that's the shadow dxdy. Uh, and then the shadow color, which is gray in my case, because I actually have black, but seven, which is the alpha, right? Seven, zero, zero. We can all read RGB, ARGB, right? Okay, well, if not, let me know. Um, so basically it's a black color, but with a alpha, so it's half transparent. And then the shadow radius is a funny name, but what it means is it's the blur size, like how, how, how blurry you want your shadow to look. So far, so good. Except that these parameters are specified in PX, not DP. So I guess this has been written a long time ago when people don't think about density on your devices. So you need to be very careful when you use these because they are going to look different depending on what the density of your screen is. And also, TaxView is not smart enough to know that if you add a shadow, your text is going to grow, right? Because I need some space below the text now. So you need to manually add your own padding. Well, with that, we can have more fun with it. Even though the parameters are called shadow, nobody said that you actually have to use it for shadow. So I'm going to abuse it a little bit. So here, I show you the XML code that I use for the blocky thing in the middle. Um, so instead of casting the shadow down, I'm actually going to move it up. And instead of having a blurry shadow, I have a solid green color. So it sort of looks like 3D, kind of. Just playing and see what other effects can we do. The glow is another one that I tried. What this does is that the shadow actually is in place. So that's the DX and the DY. We, I didn't shift it at all. But I give it a really big shadow radius so that it goes all around the text. And I change the color to yellow so that it glows. Nice little tricks. I, to be completely honest, have not actually used it in real life, but I thought, hey, maybe you will find a use case for me. And now, moving on, we're going to show you how to make things look fancier. How many of you have used custom font? Yeah, a lot of people. Um, so custom font is a great way to add a little bit of flavor to your app. Um, and kind of the most straightforward way to do it is load a typeface, which is shipped with your app in the asset folder, and then set the typeface. Uh, one quick thing to note is that you may want to cache this typeface if you're using it multiple times in your app, just so that you don't have to keep loading it. And I took a really obnoxious font just to show you that, hey, it looks different. Please don't do that in your app. This will be really difficult to read. Another thing we can do is add a text gradient. You have probably seen it before. If you have done a shape drawable by XML, you can set the start color and, and the end color, and then you will have a rectangle that is changing from one color to another. You can also do that to the text view. Um, the way to do that is that you need to retrieve the paint of your text view. So here you can see it's called textview.getPaint. 
Um, and then I'm going to create a shader, which is a linear gradient. This is essentially what you're doing in XML that, that gets translated into it. Um, so the perimeter we have here are 0, 0, which is the start point, which is the top left corner, and then 0, the text size, so that's the height um, of your text field. So you can see, then I give it the two colors, red and blue, and then it goes from top to bottom. The clamp perimeter here is not really relevant. Um, it is used when you need to tile your gradient. So for example, here, if I didn't give it the text size to be complete the height of it, maybe I give it half the height, then it will clamp, meaning that it will go from red to blue, and then it will go all the way to blue at the end, uh, just a solid color. Um, I'll show you a little bit more example of the tile mode later. And by later, I mean now. So we are going to do something also very obnoxious with our text view, which is to put some cheetah print on it. Please, again, don't really do it in your real app. Just showing you what you can do, and because of the projector, it's better to have obnoxious things so you can actually see what's happening. So very similar to what we did earlier, we also did a text view get paint set shader, but this time the shader, instead of the linear gradient, we are going to do a bitmap shader. So we're kind of reading the code backwards. So we have the set shader, and then how do we define the bitmap shader? We've defined the bitmap shader by loading a bitmap and giving it a tile mode repeat, repeat. So that means each time when you run out of, so this cheetah tile is actually much smaller than the word cheetah. So to fill the whole word, I'm going to put it side by side like that. Um, and then the bitmap is loaded via the bitmap factory from the resource folder. There's one more tile mode called mirror which is very handy when you have a tile and you want to make sure that people cannot see the seams. So every time it gets to the edge, it will flip. So we are kind of getting into more fancy looking text view at this moment. But what if we want multiple styles, right? So far I'm taking the whole text view and say, apply a big gradient on it or apply this obnoxious cheetah print on the whole thing. This it's a very similar concept to HTML, right? Because HTML will have some text, and then we can tag it up, right? So in this example, I have Hello World, which has the H1 tag, so it's bigger. And then I have an image tag, so it has the actual cute octopus picture rather than some words. Um, and I also have a link. So how will we do that? The first thing you may think of will be Web view, of course, HTML, web view, they are best friends. But actually, you can also do it in text view. And the reason why you may want to do it in text view instead of web view is that web view is very heavy, takes a while to initiate. So a lot of the times, all, if you, all you need to do is to display multiple styles, text view can do the job. So let's, how, let's see how we are going to do that. First thing first, you need to define your HTML. If you're shipping the HTML within your app, you will probably want to put it in your strings.xml file. And because the XML file already used all these, I don't know what they are called, brackets thingies, um, you, if you want to define also your HTML text, there are two ways to do it. One way is to actually escape them. So instead of putting the open thing like that, you will say, ampersand gt semicolon, but that gets really tedious if you have to manually translate all of them. Um, so this is a neat trick. You can wrap everything in the C data tag, and then you can just put in all the text as is. So I didn't learn about that until a long, long time, so I've been manually translating that. So I just want to put that out right now, so before you go and get tedious with your HTML. So after that, we need to load the string. Um, so this should be pretty familiar. Uh, we can load the string from the strings.xml file, um, file using the getString function. Once we have this string, we need to do two things. One is to set the movement method, meaning that we have a link in our XML, not XML, well in our HTML, which when we get displayed, we want to make sure when someone um, click on it, it does the proper highlighting and whatnot. So um, Android already built in has a method called link movement method, so you need to set that. And then after that, you will also need to set the actual text. Now, if you just set the string HTML directly into your text view, it will just show all the text instead of the cute octopus and whatnot. So what you need to do is to call this built-in function called 
HTML.from HTML. The first parameter is the string that is your HTML, put that in. And then the second parameter is you need to tell Android how you're going to load the images. Um, and then the third parameter is the custom tag handler, which we're going to use later. Now, let's see how we are going to define the resource image getter. What we are going to do here is, is essentially override the get drawable function from this interface. And what we are going to do is that I'm going to take the name of the drawable I want to load, in our case, the octopus, and load it from the resource folder. Um, the important thing here is that you have to call drawable.setBounce. By default, the drawable will have zero width and zero height, so it will not be displayed. Again, learn it the hard way. I did it, no octopus, sad. So figure out that, oh, because it didn't know how big the octopus needs to be. Um, so, and you actually don't need to hard code the size because it actually internally knows how big the drawable is when you're loading it from the resource folders. So I don't know why Android doesn't do it for me. Anyway, so you should need to call it the set bounds with um, the zero, zero, again, the start coordinate and the end co coordinate, meaning the width and the height. And so once you do that, then Android will know how to display that picture. Um, this is uh, just an animation to show you that, yes, the link actually works, in case you doubt me. Um, so that, that is just a um, normal href link that you have in your, in your HTML. This is all fine and good, except that there's a very limited set of tags that is supported. And on top of that, it's defined by the platform. So if you have an earlier version of Android versus the latest version of Android, it may not be the same. Of course, you can code to the lowest common denominator, that's fine. Or you can also extend it with a custom tag handler. But before I explain to you how the custom tag handler works, we need to understand spans. So as we saw earlier, in HTML, we can tag up our text with these tags. So here I have a U tag, which is the underlying tag. Under the hood, what it actually means semantically is that I have a string, one, two, three, plus I have an underline from the position four to six. And when this get loaded into Android using the HTML dot from HTML function, it's going to be translated into a spanable string so that we know that at pos from position four to six, there is an underline, and then we define that with an underline span. So that's kind of the basics of how Android knows that, oh, I'm not just displaying plain text. I'm displaying text with some styling and images and other things. There are many, many built-in styles that Android already provides, so the underline span is one of them. Um, and it's an example of a character style, meaning that it's changing the behavior on the character level. Other examples are foreground color span, background color span, or uh, once again, the underlying span. Another kind is the paragraph style. So instead of changing the look of each character, it's going to affect the whole paragraph. For instance, you can use bullet span to add a bullet, or you can use the icon margin span to add an icon before your text starts. Quote span will put a quote in front of your paragraph. I'm not actually going to go through all of them in this talk because somebody else wrote a really good blog post about it, so I would highly encourage you to go there and learn a lot more. Once again, the slide deck is available and I already put it on Twitter, the, the whole link, so you can go ahead and get the deck and then click on it. Or take a picture, I guess, if you really want to. But it's gonna move on, so no more time. So, now let's go through an example of how we actually use a custom tag handler. What we're gonna do here, it's pretty fun, I think, is we are going to display this fraction in our tag view. How do we do that? Well, there is a feature that is called text pane set font feature settings, which allow us to essentially tell the font to do something different. Um, this is something new, this is something that's introduced in Lollipop. Um, in, the partic in our particular case, we can pick a font that supports the A frag, which I think stands for alternative fraction, not 100% sure. But 
The point is that this is the A thread is the string that you can pass onto set form feature settings, and Android, if you are using a font that supports this fraction format, will know what to do. So here, what we are doing is that we are going to tag up different parts of my string to tell Android that I want it to be displayed in this stack fraction style. Now the reason why we're doing that is because if you look at the very first fraction, it's one and a half, right? If I want to, how do I tell Android whether it is 11 over two or one and a half? So with the tag like this, I can very specifically tell Android that from this position to this position is where the fraction is defined. Once again, I'm doing the C data trick so that I don't have to escape everything by hand. Now, the custom tag handler will take two different things. So first of all, I need to load up the typeface, meaning the font. And this Nusso font is a particular font that I found online that allows this type of fractions. Once again, we are going to set the font face to Sorry, set the typeface to that. So it's very similar to the example I showed you earlier. But the fancy part comes from the HTML that we're going to set. So here, again, we are loading the string from the XML, the strings.xml file. And then we are going to set the text calling the HTML from HTML function. So this time, we're giving it a null image um, getter because we don't have any images in here. But we are going to give it the fraction tag handler, which we are going to define. And this is a tag handler. It goes really dense, but I'm going to kind of tell you at high level what's happening. So what happened is that every time Android sees a tag that it doesn't understand, it will call into this function and say, can you handle it? Um, so for us, we are only going to handle the AFRAC tag that we customly defined. So we say, if it's not an AFRAC tag, just return. I don't want to bother with it. But if it is, what we're going to do is that we are going to essentially set a span in the text, right? So the very first um, if opening tag, meaning that, because in HTML, there's a pair, right? It starts and ends. So if I'm given this opening tag, I'm going to mark it with the span mark mark. I don't know what it means, but <laughs> I just use it to mark that that's the beginning of my fraction. Else. If it's not the beginning, that means it's the end. Then I'm going to try to get the last position of my custom tag, and then go ahead and know, now that I know the beginning and the end, I can go ahead and do the output dot set span, and then I can set a fraction span on it. So again, like the code is pretty dense, but this is a heuristics to find where the last tag is so that I can match it up with the beginner tag. With that, we still need to define the fraction span. Surprisingly, it's not that difficult. To define the fraction span, what we're going to do is going to extend the metric affecting span, which is defined by Android. What that does, it, it will let you override two functions, the update measure state and the update draw state, both of which I'm going to just set the text paint to be using this font feature setting, the AFRAC. Um, the reason why I picked metric affecting span is because it changes the size of my text, right? If I have one slash two, and then it got moved and changed to one over two, it gets smaller. So um, there, that's why like, I picked metric affecting span. So with that, the nice thing is that I can have arbitrary fractions. Some of the fonts already come with these fractions, like one over two, three over four, kind of the standard ones. But what if I want something like the second row? Does that ring a bell, those fractions? Pi, our favorite number. Well, approximations to pi. And I seriously doubt that I can find any font that will embed in it 103993 over 33102. That would be a pretty ginormous font. But with this technique, I can put any arbitrary fractions. So, question. A fraction in a fraction. What do you mean by a fraction in a fraction? So you have a fraction and then on top have like one and a half in the bottom. Ah, so he wanted to put fraction in a fraction. I don't think that's a part of the open type spec. Um, so I doubt you can do that. But I'm not a 
expert in open type either. Uh, so this is taking advantage of open type, which is a font specification, and they have the spe uh, fraction specification inside it. Um, I, I don't know how often you need to use yes. fraction on top of each other, so probably not. That would be my guess. Now, styled string. Have any one of you used styles in text, meaning that you're defining your style in style.xml and then applying it? Yeah, okay. So we're just extending that idea. So instead of having one single style, we can have multiple styles in the same text view. So if you are not at this talk and you look at this screenshot, you will probably assume that I have three text views here. One for big red, one for medium green, and one for small blue. But actually, there's a single text view here. This is going to be a recurring theme. You may think that there are multiple text fields, but there's only one. Here, I'm going to first define a helper function. What it does, it takes a context, a text ID, meaning uh, a value you define in the strings.xml, and a style ID, which is a value that you define in your styles.xml. And what it's going to do, it's going to load the text and create a spannable string, and then we are going to set that spannable string, the whole string, with the style that is passed to us by style ID. And I'm going to return it. Why? Because we are going to feed that into a spannable string builder. Has anyone used a string buffer? So, okay, so this is a very similar syntax. You're essentially creating a, sp uh, a string by adding the component one after another. So with the helper function I defined earlier, I'm able to say, Okay, I'm going to first append the first string, which is loaded from r.string.bigred as the text, and r.style.bigred text appearance as the style. And then append a new line, and then append the medium green, append a new line, and then append the small blue. And everything right now actually is still just inside the builder. We haven't actually had a string yet. To use that string, which actually is not a pure just like string string, it's actually a spannable string. We need to retrieve it from the builder. In my case, I just want to take the whole string, so I'm going to ask for the subsequent from zero to the end. And then I'm going to call set view. Um, then, then text view will know that, oh, okay, this string has three parts that have spans in it, and I'm going to go ahead and load the uh, uh, text appearance accordingly. And for those of you who may not have done the style definition, I also included an example for the big red text appearance. Um, I'm going to define the text style as 56 SP because I want it to be really big. And I'm going to define the text color as C00 because as we have established earlier, we all read RGB and this is red. So moving on, like I warned you, this is going to be yet another one of those, haha, you think there are multiple text view in it, but there's only one of them. So the knock-knock joke area, knock-knock who's there, may look like that I have two text views, but in fact, there's only a single one of them. Well, the bottom one, there's a button, and then an edit text, and then another button. So OK, fine, there are four things in this view. But still, if you think of it, imagine that this is a chat application, right? If you, every single time some new message come in, you have to inflate a new text view and attach it to a linear layout, it gets expensive, right? The more views the uh, hierarchy has, the more Android has to, to track it. So let's go through how we're going to go and make it with a single text field for the whole chat history. Once again, we are going to use some of the built-in span, but this time we're going to use alignment span, which is a paragraph style rather than a character style. So what we're going to do is every time someone type on that uh, edit text and click on either left or right, we are going to call this click function. We're going to retrieve the text, and then depending on whether the left button or the right button is clicked, I'm going to make an alignment span using either normal or opposite. Uh, so in our case, normal is to the left, and opposite is to the right. Once I did that, I'm going to call this append text function with the text and the alignment that I want. Um, and then I'm going to set the edit text to null so that you can type a new thing. Append text is my helper function. What it does is it will create an alignment span and it's going to take, use the parameter that I pass in, the align parameter, which is either going to be normal or opposite. And once again, create a spannable string, set the span, um, and then I'm going to also append uh, two new lines 
uh, if it is not the first message. So this is a pretty standard way of using spans. You are going to be creating a spanable string, and then you're going to set span and give it the position, which if you kind of think way early at the slide I gave you of the underlying span, all you're doing here is just defining all this extra markup to Android so that it knows to decorate it in various ways. So in, in this particular case, I'm actually taking the whole span uh, because I, it's a paragraph style. So it doesn't make sense to be, I just want to uh, move the first character to the right. That doesn't make any sense. So I'm going to take the whole string. And we are going to get even more interesting. The basic idea stays the same. You are still setting the string from a certain position to another position. But we are going to make a rainbow highlight. So this little demo, oh, and by the way, the whole repository is going to be, there's a link at the end, so you can actually download this and play with it. Um, so this particular demo has a text, uh, edit text at the bottom. So whatever you type there, it's going to search in the block of text, and then it's going to highlight in rainbow color. How do we do that? Um, so the code I'm showing you right now is basically just setting the span. By this point, you should be pretty familiar with it, so let's jump right into how we define the rainbow span. The rainbow span, well, it this time extends character style because we are operating on character level, but it also implements the interface update appearance. This tells Android that, hey, it's going to change the look of this span for this internal drawing uh, functions. Um, so this is just one half of, the span, of this span. So in the constructor, what I'm going to do is I'm going to load an array of colors as integers and as defined in my XML file. So in my case, it's going to go from red to orange to yellow to green to blue, so five colors. And then this is very similar to what we did earlier when we did the gradient that goes from red to blue from top to bottom. But it's slightly more complicated because we have multiple colors. Because that function signature only takes two parameters, so you only have two. Uh, but worry not, what we're going to do is that I'm going to calculate actually how big the span is going to be. And the other difference is that the the earlier example when I'm doing top to bottom is pretty much static, the size, right? Because I know the height is not going to change. But this one will change depending on how long your search string is going to be, which is why um, the size is a page dot get text size and then have to multiply it by the number of colors. Um, actually, I lied. So the multiplication, it, it actually does not depend on the uh, search string. It depends on the number of colors. So what I'm going to do is then I'm using the five colors, but it, I use the mirror mode so that when I reach the end of the color, I'm going to flip it. So it will do red, orange, yellow, green, blue, green, yellow, orange, red again. So you can highlight something really long. Um, so as promised, so I'm, I'm showing you all the tile mode. So this time I'm going to use mirror mode. One other trick is that if you just do this, it will do like what we saw earlier, meaning the text uh, rainbow color is going to go from top to bottom. And you know, if you want to show five colors in that, you are not going to see it. So what we're going to do, we're going to set the rotation on it. The way you do that is you define a matrix, and then you're going to say that I'm going to rotate it by 90 degrees, and then you're going to set the matrix on the shader, which is the linear gradient, with that matrix, so then we'll, it will turn it sideways. And then with all that, we're going to set the paint to this particular shader. And everything happens under the update draw state function, which is within your span. So this is how I'm able to change the behavior just at the string that is the word rainbow rather than the whole text view. And things are going to get even more interesting. Um, actually, someone told me that I didn't know that I needed an animated rainbow span in my life until I saw your talk. This is very nice to look at. Uh, so how do we implement that? Um, it's still on top of the early example of the rainbow span, but adding an object animator. Uh, has anyone used object animator? One person. I feel like that person should give this talk. He always raises his hand when I ask questions. So an object animator, for those of you who have not done it, is a way in Android that allows you to change the field of an object, essentially. And it's an animation, so you're 
going to change it with a, with a certain animated um, function, meaning the interpolator. So let's walk through this code. It's going to be a little bit clearer. So I define an object animator, which I'm going to be changing the value of a float. And it's going to be from 0 to 100. And this is the float that I'm going to be using to kind of shift the color. Right? You can see it's basically a whole rainbow, but they just get shifted and then just shift back. Um, and then once I have that, what I'm going to do is that for this object animator, every time the value gets changed, I'm going to reset the text view um, so that it will get redrawn. Um, so this object on animator, I'm going to have a linear interpolator, meaning that it's a constant speed. Most of the time when you see animations in Android, it's an accelerate, decelerate, but it's a little bit distracting if you keep changing the speed on my already very distracting animated rainbow span, so I'm using a linear interpolator. Um, and then the rest of it is I, I want it to be in repeating infinitely. Um, and then once I have all that set up, I can start the object animator. With that, we are going to take a look at what exactly happened when we have that animator change the value. Uh, so here, the animator, what it does is that I'm going to use this on my animated color span, which is something that I define, which has a function called set translate x percentage, so x meaning the x position, so that you can shift things. Um, and then the getter and setter at that point is pretty obvious. It's just, oh, okay, get me the value and set me the value. So the meat of it is inside this function, which is in my span. Well, actually, why do I even show you code for the getter and setter? Like I said, pretty obvious. Now, in my span, once again, in my update drawable state function, what we are going to do is very similar to the static rainbow span. I'm going to define a shader, and I'm also going to rotate it sideways. That's why I have the set rotate. But I'm also going to have an additional line, which is the post translate function. And I'm going to multiply the percentage by the width, which is the width of this whole span. Um, actually, let me see. No, the width is the, is the size of the, um, the gradient, right? So I'm going to multiply that width by the percentage so that I know how much to shift. And once again, once I did that, then I'll set the local matrix on my shader and then set the shader. So the animator is the part that's in charge of changing the value of this translate x percentage. And with that, I'm given, the span is given this value. So at different time, it will have like from zero, or maybe 20%, 30%, etc. And I'm going to go ahead and shift that gradient with that. So far so good? It's a little bit more complex than the other examples we have. Uh, one more example. This is really just a, a whole series of examples. Um, here I'm showing you a clickable span, which on first glance you're like, well, we already seen that in the XTML example. But instead of going to a link, it opens the setting page. So we can define the behavior of your click with your own clickable span. Clickable span is actually an in, uh, interface, so by default it doesn't really do anything. Um, so what we are going to do here? Well, same deal, we are going to find the substring that we are going to add a span to, which is pretty much everything until the last line. And then in the last line, we are also going to make sure that the text view contains the link movement method, because once again, that's the thing that allows Android to change the highlight and color of your link when the user click on it. Afterwards, we need to define our own clickable span. Uh, pretty simple, you need to override the onClick function and then once you do that, then when the user click on that span, Android will execute this code. In our case, we want to start the activity, which is the settings activity. And uh, conveniently, the onclick function pass you the view, which is get clicked on, and I can just grab the context from the view so that I can call start activity. And one more thing, which is that the clickable span by default understands the XML parameters that we are using for the URL links. So here I'm defining that the text color and the text highlight, which it's a little bit too fast. Um, if you can see, yes, you see? So when you click on it, the, the so text itself is green, and then when you click on it, the background is also green. So you can change the behavior of your clickable span without actually writing Java code. You can define that X, the XML parameter that you're probably already using. Okay. One more example, which is aligned paper. 
here I have an edit text, which uh, most of you know as a child of a text field, so a lot of techniques we discussed already applies. And I want to look, make it look like a essentially root paper, and then whenever I have lines of text, it will draw those underlines. And the interesting part is that it will know kind of how big your, how many number of lines you have and draw a line on each of them. So how are we gonna do this? It's a trick question because so far I've been showing you how do you do it, do everything essentially with spans. Here we're actually not gonna be using spans. We are going to override the draw function uh, in, on the edit text. So if you have done any custom drawing, it is very important that every time you do custom drawing, you remember not to call new, you, not to instantiate any variable because the onDraw function get called multiple times per second. And if you keep creating new objects, they will just kind of collect there and then the garbage collector need to run all the time to clean up. So that's why I'm showing you the uh, constructor, which I'm going to do a new paint object, but notice that it's this dot paint. So I'm stashing it away in a member, a member field. And then I'm going to set all the styles I want. So I blew up the size of the lined paper just so that you can see what's happening. Um, I'm going to make that paint a stroke style, so it's a line, um, and then I'm going to set this color, and I'm going to set a stroke width to be dependent on the line height. Um, so this is a pretty nice trick because I want to make sure that whatever the size of my text view, the line makes sense, right? So in our case, because the text size is so big, the line becomes thicker. Um, and then one final little touch is that the stroke cap. The stroke cap is the end of the line, so I don't think there's enough resolution for you to see, but you can look at the slide that later. Um, each line, instead of ending in like abruptly like a triangle, is actually round, which most of the time you can't see it, but if you decided to use a giant font, you will see that it's nice and round. So once we have a f our uh, paint defined, we need to go ahead and draw it. Um, we are going to, like I said, override the onDraw function. Uh, how many of you have done that before, override onDraw function? Okay, so fair amount of you. Uh, so the idea is that whenever text view wants to draw something, I want to draw the line first. Um, so if you skip to the last line, it says super dot on draw. So basically everything that I'm doing happens before text view draws its text. And make sure you call the super function, otherwise you'll just have lines and no text, right? Because I'm overriding this on draw function. So what are we doing here? Well, we need to decide where are we going to start drawing that line. And the start point is going to be the padding left rather than zero because we want to respect the padding given to us by the user. And then the start point is going to be rather than all the way to the end using get width, the padding right subtracted off that width. So we know the start position and end position. And then the Y position is going to be the same because it's, it's a horizontal line rather than a tilted line. Um, that's the part that gets interesting. We are going to, well, at the padding top, again, we need to respect the padding, but we need to then get the paint, which is what uh, Android uses to draw the text, and get its font metric so that we can say that, oh, okay, I'm going to be doing this from the, from the top of, of the font, and then, I also need to kind of float it above that uh, little line there, because the line actually has a width. That's why I have the paint stop get stroke width over two, so that I can offset that. After I've defined like which position we're going to draw this, we are going to draw it per line. And for each line, I'm going to further offset that Y position depending on which line you are, which is why I'm multiplying the line height by I, which is which line you're at. Once you do that complicated math, then you can just call canvas.drawline with the start x, y, and then stop x, y, and the paint, which we defined in the constructor. Um, so font metric is a really handy class if you are doing any uh, custom text view appearance because it allows you to get parameters of how your text itself is rendered. So the parameter that I used, the font metric dot top, is the maximum distance about the baseline. So, um, so basically, it will allow you to know that, oh, okay, this is how tall my text is going to be. And finally, 
Why am I doing all these things, teaching you all these techniques? Well, for me, I love emoji, so I really want to know how I can embed images in line with text. So we are going to actually have four techniques to do emoji because one is not enough. Because emoji is that awesome. So this is an example of how we will look like with before we apply any custom span or any like fancy technique. To your left is I just have some emoji that's already defined in Unicode. Um, which, for example, here I have the little heart and I have the little cloud, which is great. Um, and then this is this is run I think on my. Um, lollipop device um, so but then the skia emoji which is also a unicode it doesn't know so it did a little x with a box in it not that good to the right is after i apply all these techniques uh, then you can see all the lovely emoji including our favorite octopus right there um, so technique number one is you can use unicode with system font meaning do nothing uh, you're just going to go into the unicode and then see because Unicode has different parts, right? That's the ASCII part, which is what we're familiar with. And then there's other languages, maybe Chinese, maybe Vietnamese. Um, but there's also part that is symbols. Um, so for example, the heart symbol, I can just embed that directly. The problem with that is that it's inconsistent. So to my, to the right hand, oh, actually to the left hand side, this is running ice cream sandwich. And in ice cream sandwich, we can just use the system font to display the heart and the cloudy thing. Looks good. But if you look at the lollipop implementation, it looks different. The cloud thingy is colorful, which may or may not be a problem. You know, people can still see it. But it also does things differently when it doesn't understand the emoji. So the skier emoji on the left is just blank. It has nothing. And on the right, it has a little, the square with a cross on it. Um, so this is kind of your quickest way to do emoji without our, any of our fancy technique. We can use that for something like a heart probably because like, it has been there since forever. Um, but another way we could do is a combination. So we can have our text with the Unicode in it, but then use our custom font so that we know exactly how it's going to be displayed independent on which system, which OS level you are going to run this at. So here I'm going to make an icon font span. What I'm going to do then is, so we're going to talk about how we're going to define the icon font span in the next slide. But what we're going to do is we're going to go through the whole text, and then we are going to be looking for the Unicode um, code point 26F7, which is the skier. Um, every time I see that code point, I'm going to set the span with an icon font span. And the icon font span, what we are going to be doing is that we're going to load the typeface. Um, this is I'm actually showing you what I said very early on is how do you, uh, you need to cache your font if you're going to be using it multiple times because it's pretty expensive to load. So I have a static variable that is a typeface and I'm going to load it from this uh, font file which contains the skier. Um, after that, inside this icon font, which again is a metric affecting font because the skier is going to take more space than like the letter S or other um, glyph. Once I have that, it's pretty simple. What we're going to do is override the update measure state and update draw state function so that it knows that we are going to be using this particular typeface. Um, so I've only shown you half of what I did. So with this, the ski I will have the skier picture, but it's going to be black or whatever color is your text field. So to make it blue, you will need to, on top of that, apply a foreground color uh, span. Then you can have a blue skier among your gray text, for example. Um, so another thing you may want to do is, I have something that is not defined in uh, the, any of the code point in my in the Unicode, right? I want an octopus. Actually, there may be, I don't know. Nowadays, the emoji uh, has expanded a lot. But let's say there's no octopus in it. So I'm going to do that with my own syntax. So this is a pretty popular syntax using colon something, colon, I think GitHub uses, Slack uses it. So we're going to use that as well. And what we're going to do is that we are going to load that particular image out of our resource folder. Um, so this tag is essentially we are using the same 
matcher. So we are going to look for colon octopus colon. And every time I find that, um, if nobody has uh, loaded the octopus yet, I'm going to go ahead and load it from my resource folder. And then I'm going to scale the bitmap to the text size. This is very important because I only have one text, oh, sorry, one size of octopus in my resource folder. And people can use the octopus in fonts that is big and small. And I don't want the octopus to be always the same size. I want it to be big when the text is big and small when the text is small. Um, so I'm going to show you how the size is computed. Um, but once I have defined the bitmap, then I'm going to call an image span, which is actually a uh, system span. And I'm going to pass it the octopus and also the align baseline uh, parameter, which means that I want the octopus to sit on the baseline. Baseline meaning that, um, so if you, if you, 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 can, you can sort of imagine a baseline drawn right, along all the lines. Um, the other option is you can have it just sit at the bottom which I think most of the emoji looks better sitting on baseline, but those are your two options. Um, if you don't know what's baseline, I have included a little <laughs> diagram. So the baseline is the red line that's under the dog. Um, but if you are not having the image sitting on the baseline, then it will sit below, um, which to me looks a little bit off. Um, so the other interesting thing about all these is that once you're defining your own span, you can actually draw anything you want. <laughs> Let's see how we do it. Um, so th this example, we are going to be using the last three things, which is kind of the speed limit sign. Um, I first gave, it talk, gave this talk in Sweden, so I picked the color scheme, which is the yellow circle with a red uh, ring around it and then a black number inside. So what we're going to do is that we are going to put some, much like the octopus one, so I'll start with a colon, but instead of just a static string in between, I'll have speed underscore and then a number. So this is what the very first line does. It is a regular expression that matches two or three numbers. I mean, I could have matched as many numbers as I want, but then if your speed limit is one million, um, then it wouldn't fit in a circle nicely. So I figure, you know, don't drive that fast. So just three, at most three digits. So once I found like that pattern, so like speed underscore one one zero, what we're going to do is going to go ahead and once again create a span. This time called speed sign draw. Um, sorry, image span. Sorry, we're going to create an image span sitting on the baseline. But instead of setting it with a bitmap that we load from the resources, we are going to set a speed sign drawable, which we are going to define later later meaning now. Um, lots of math here. Uh, the reason why we need to do this, once again, we want to make sure that the size of our little speed sign matches the text view. So once again, we are doing all this in the constructor because later we're going to be calling the draw function and we do not want to instantiate anything there. So I'm stashing away the ascent, descent, text size, stroke width, um, and then going to also set the bounds of this drawable. Because remember, if you have a drawable and you don't set the bounds, it's going to be zero and you're not going to see it. Um, so I'm setting the size to be negative ascent. Why negative? The font matrix, you have the baseline and then it's actually measured from that point on. So this direction is going to be negative and this direction is going to be positive. So by default, the ascent is actually a negative number. So I want to negate it back to positive so that I can use it as a size. Um, like I said, we are going to be overriding the draw function. Um, in this particular case, we're going to draw three things. We'll draw the yellow circle and then the red ring and then the black number. The drawing function, if you have done any custom drawing, like at this point, is very familiar. It's nothing really specific to the text except that you need to compute the size according to all those font metrics that you stashed away earlier. Um, so in our case, we want the size of the yellow circle to be the ascent size, like the whole height of it. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and create a paint that's yellow and it's fill, so that instead of uh, like just the ring, it's going to fill it all up. And then I'm going to draw it at, uh, the, with the center size of a two, size of a two, and the radius size of a two, and with that specific paint. Next, we're going to draw the red ring. Um, this time, we're going to use stroke because it's just around. 
um, the again I'm doing relative map so I want to define the width of that ring with respect to the size so it's just one tenth of the whole ring rather than oh it's always going to be like six pixels or something so that that way it will also scale um, with the size of your text um, and then the rest of the code is drawing that circle and then just making sure that I'm taking the size of the ring itself into account when I compute the radius size that's why the radius is size over two minus ring, ring width over two rather than just the size over two and finally we're going to draw the black number uh, so this is going to be a little bit more interesting in the sense that we are going to be computing the text size according to the text size of the rest of the text but we have a ratio which is 0 0.4 just by trial and error I want it to be smaller because I want to fit it inside the circle um, and then I define what color I want and I want it to be bold um, and the other thing of note is the positioning so I'm going to draw this text its position is just smack in the middle and then I'm going to call set text align so that it's going to be actually in the middle unfortunately you cannot do that with Y you cannot just say Y is also size over 2 and then align it with a V center or something you actually have to do the math to put it in the right position so that it's in the middle and that's the long thing after the int Y um, so I'm computing the size of it by combining the ascend and the descend and then I'm going to make it smaller uh, sorry, not smaller. I'm going to divide by two so that it's centered. And with all that calculation, you can call canvas.drawText and then give it the text you want to draw, which is the number and the position and then the paint. Whew, that was a lot of examples. Um, so I can barely fit all the examples on the slide. This is everything that we've covered today. Uh, we have done the animated compound drawable, text shadow, custom text. I'm going to, not going to read them all. Just want to hopefully fill your toolbox with a lot of different techniques so you can go and make beautiful text views and if that is not enough there's another talk that was given at DragCon New York City in August that is by Lisa Ray and she also did a lot of neat tricks of, about text view and very interestingly very disjoint set of things so I did this set of things that I just showed you she did something um, different so I would highly encourage you to go watch her talk as well uh, with that thank you very much like I said the whole slide deck is online that's the very first link now I will encourage you to actually bust out your phones and take pictures so that you can go visit the slide deck or you can just follow me on Twitter it's already there um, the sec second link is the GitHub repository of all the examples. Um, if you are too lazy to actually download and compile, you can also get the APK so that you can watch the animated rainbow span in full glory. Um, and then the rest of it is where you can find me on the internet. I also do a fair amount of video course teaching. Um, so there's two links, the Pro site and the Gumroad link are my two places that I publish video classes if you're interested in learning more from me. Um, and then yeah, the rest is where you can find me on the internet, blog, Twitter, etc. Thank you very much.